Thanks to uh, Victor and the entire team at Harbor UCLA for the privilege of contributing to this course. Um, it, it's truly an honor. And uh, Victor and I, we go back uh, many decades now. Uh, I met Victor first, um, I think it's early 1990s, when I was in Hamburg, Germany, working with Nipsey Hendra. He uh, was a frequent visitor, uh, was always uh, so eager to uh, absorb uh, all of the newest developments. And of course, Nipsey Hendra uh, was a true uh, innovator. And uh, at one point, uh, Victor uh, uh, decided to uh, import, because uh, it was really literally that at the time, import uh, interventional EUS uh, to Southern California. And so he invited me, Thomas Rush, and Locke Teo uh, to his unit at Harbor UCLA uh, to do his first live demonstration. So I don't know if Victor's in the audience, but um, of course it's challenging to invite three Europeans who have a long flight to get to uh, Los Angeles. And so uh, how does one make it as attractive as possible to come to LA? Well, number one, you invite them during the winter, uh, the winter in Europe, of course. There's no winter in Southern California. Um, so I think it was January, perfect time. Uh, so that already upped the ante here, made it more attractive. Uh, but the second thing is he told us about his sailboat and uh, that after the conference, we would go to Catalina Island on his sailboat. That definitely did it for all three of us and we were on our way to uh, his center to do the first uh, live transmission of cases from his unit. So there's a long tradition uh, to this course, and, and I just, again, just want to recognize Victor uh, for that. He's been a true champion of interventional endoscopy. All right, now let's turn to EOS guided gallbladder drainage. And I I'm asking if it's ready for prime time, uh, so let's answer that at the end. Next slide. So the gallbladder is something we always see when we enter into the duodenal bulb. It, it's almost predictably there. You can also see it from the antrum of the stomach, uh, but from the duodenal bulb, it, it is right up against the, the duodenal wall there. In fact, um, it's easily confused for a cyst, a pancreatic cyst, for example. And when I was performing, in, performing US guided pseudocyst drainage, I at one, for in one case had accidentally punctured the gallbladder thinking it was a pseudocyst. It was a, a hydroptic gallbladder, a very large gallbladder, and uh, I punctured it and I got bile back. Um, and um, unfortunately, that patient developed, just from that puncture, a bile duct leak and uh, ended up having to go to surgery. So that was sort of my first encounter with EWIS guided gallbladder drainage, of course, was an intentional there. Uh, it was a misadventure of having confused the gallbladder for uh, a pseudocyst. But it, it, it emphasizes really the point that we're dealing with something very similar to a pseudocyst. We see it like a pseudocyst. It's up against the wall like a pseudocyst. Next slide. Um, and this is an instance where I drained the gallbladder successfully. This is 2008. Uh, and I used a covered wall stent to do this. But this is a patient with sclerosing peritonitis. I've underlined it because that is the, the key here. And I was able to do this successfully. You can see the wall stent. This was the old wall stent, as you can see. This is back, from, back in 2008. And here you see all the stones coming out. So this is sort of my, my, my first flirtation with EOS-guided gallbladder drainage in a patient who was a non-surgical candidate. And this was the only option to treat acute gallstone cholecystitis. And I was ecstatic uh, at this, the, our ability to create a cholecystoduodenostomy using a SEMS. Um, but this is a special case because this patient had sclerosing peritonitis. Next slide. Because the challenge of gallbladder drainage is that the lumens are normally not adherent. They were adherent in this case of sclerosing peritonitis. In fact, I went down to, the, to radiology and I discussed this case with the radiologist and I asked them, what is the risk 
a vile leak if I try to drain this gallbladder. After all, I maybe had the very first experience in the world of a bile leak from a misguided attempt at draining what I thought was a pseudocyst, and it was a gallbladder. And the answer was, because this patient has sclerosing peritonitis, the gallbladder is probably going to be socked in with scar tissue, and you, it should be safe. That's why I had the courage to proceed, and I was able to do it safely. That's normally not the case. There's a high risk of perforation, leakage, and peritonitis. And if you look on EUS, you will always see, with normal anatomy, an echogenic layer between the duodenal wall and the gallbladder lumen. That echogenic layer is fat tissue, mesentery. So that is that the fact that this is a mobile structure and none in here it makes this a completely different challenge. All right, let's go to the next slide. There have been reports of gallbladder drainage with plastic stents dating back to 2007, several case series done, and reporting great success. So certainly possibility. These were all, of course, non-surgical candidates. But the complication rate was 11%, and these complications were related to leak. So there was bile leak in two cases, and there was air leak with a pneumoperitoneum, symptomatic, in two cases. Next slide. To prevent or reduce that risk of leak, fully covered self-expandable metal stents have been used. And I used that, as you just saw in that video. And this is a design from Korea with flared ends to reduce the risk of migration. So this is 65 patients. This was reported in 2014 with acute cholecystitis. They placed at 10 by up to seven centimeter long fully covered stems with these flared flanges. Great technical and functional success. And yet, despite using a SIMS, there was perforation in one case. There was pneumoperitoneum in two cases. And then there were late complications. There was migration despite the flared ends, ends and there was occlusion in two cases. Next slide. So I started thinking about the question, why, are, why do we have bile leak? Now obviously with plastic stents, the, you're going to get leakage around a plastic stent. But why would you still get bile leak with a fully covered self-expandable metal stent? How can we prevent it? And the first answer in my mind was we need to eliminate over the wire exchangers. The self-expandable metal stent is helpful after you get the stent in. You won't get leak probably after you place the stent. But you're going to get leak up to the point that you deploy your stent if you're doing over the wire exchanges. Any time, every time you remove your instrument, whatever it is, the dilating balloon, bougie, or FNA needle, you're going to get leak through that hole because your wire is not plugging up that hole. Really what you want is a single device that will enable you to puncture, prime the tract, dilate the tract, and deploy your stent all, in, all at once. I won't say one step because these are actually multiple steps, but you're combining these steps into one device. So can we come up with a device that allows us to do that? That's the challenge that I posed, at least for, for myself. And then, of course, we need a SIMS that is designed, dedicated for transluminal drainage, because all of our SIMS were not designed for that. They were designed for luminal uh, recanalization. And this would need to be leak-proof, and it would need to be migration-proof. And even with that Korean design with flared ends, you still had migration. So that's not the ideal stent yet. Next slide. So these are the two solutions that I came up with and is the foundation for the company that became Exlumina. And today, uh, it, uh, the, this product line is, 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 is being marketed by, by Boston Scientific. So the first, and I'm, I'm going to mention this first because I actually consider this the more important of the two is the elimination of over-the-wire exchanges. So this cautery-enhanced delivery system allows us to now puncture the gallbladder 
enter into the gallbladder with our sheath, which is preloaded with our SEMS. And we can immediately deploy the SEMS after we've entered into the gallbladder. So we want a one device puncture to stent deployment without any exchanges. Now the SEMS itself for transluminal drainage, this is actually, you know, it's very simple if you think about it. It's just big cartwheels, you know, big flanges. But what's unique and where the engineers did a fantastic job is the design so that you get a hugging of these two walls against one another to keep them in apposition. So that's a unique feature of this. Of course it needs to be fully coated and it needs to be short because you want it just to straddle the wall. You don't want it extending into either the duodenal lumen or the bowel lumen and you don't want it extending into the gallbladder. Next slide. So this is the animal study that I published in 2011. This animal study doesn't do justice to the many, many dozens of studies that were done that led to the, to, to the final designs that, that we came up with. Uh, myself with a, a, a team of just great, great engineers. As I mentioned earlier, literally uh, the, the best here on the peninsula in Silicon Valley. Um, and and I, I always like to take an opportunity to recognize them because they sort of, they're the forgotten heroes, if you will. These engineers are, are just amazing and they make this possible. So this is just for survival pigs, uh, but it represents the culmination of many trial and error and many designs and so forth. This is just sort of the final where we said, okay, now we're ready to publish. And we had created a port for cholecystoscopy because our goal was not just the drainage, it was really to extend the reach of the interventional endoscopist to a structure outside the GI tract. So an extension of therapy to the extra luminal space. And all these stents remained patent at two months. So we had survival studies. All of them were easily removable. That was part of the design challenge uh, as all of this went through the trial and error and different prototypes and so forth. And all of them showed uh, focal wall adherence on the necropsy studies. Now you can see that on the bottom right, the gallbladder uh, and the bowel wall, the, uh, the, the, this is not duodenum, it's actually stomach because of the anatomy of the pig, um, and you can see the stent. All right, so you can see on the images on the left, you can see the scope going through the axial stent into the gallbladder. We inject a contrast, you can see it now um, anterogradely, right? This is an anterograde injection into uh, the bile duct via the cystic duct. Um, and there on the right lower image, you can see the view of the normal gallbladder. And for me, that was uh, amazing to, f to actually see what the gallbladder looked like on his inside. I'd never seen that. Next slide. This emphasizes why I think this technology of what's now called LAMS, lumen opposing metal stent, is so critical to extend our reach. So it's not just about having a self-expandable metal stent with a bigger lumen. It's about having a stent that won't migrate, won't dislodge when we pass our scopes through it. That's, that's really the unique advance that's been made possible. So it's our ability to, for example, go in the gallbladder and you can see here, you can remove gallstones and I've done that many times now. So you can actually evacuate the entire gallbladder of all its stones. You can do that mechanically with the tools that we use for ERCP. Next slide. It's also very important that this type of technology be controlled by the operator. This is not something that you can delegate to the assistant. And why? Because there's too much at stake. There's no room, there's no margin of error that you can allow. It has to be done 100% accurately and precisely because you're dealing with a stent that's just one centimeter in length. So you have to place those flanges very precisely and if you're off just a little bit, then it makes the difference between success and a potential you know, disaster uh, and a patient that might have to go to surgery. So uh, this design you saw, I'm not gonna go into this, 
uh, since you just saw this in the live demonstration. But the key feature that the engineers enabled was to allow us to develop each flange independent of one another. Now that may sound right now as a very obvious thing. It's not. It took a few years to actually perfect this so that you could control the release of each flange independent of one another. All right, so let's go to the next slide. And this is a video from, uh, from Hong Kong, from their course. And uh, uh, I was able to do this case before it was allowed in the US because of FDA regulations. Um, and let's uh, let this video play just quickly. It shows really the same that you saw before. Um, and click on it, yeah. So the direct puncture of the gallbladder with the electrocautery enhanced system, hot axios, we're in the gallbladder. This patient also had a cholecystostomy that had been previously placed. Um, you see the deployment of the distal flange. Back at this time, the protocol was to look for the black mark. I, I actually don't think that's necessary. You can do this all under ultrasound guidance. You see the proximal flange deployed. You see the pus draining out and you see the dilation of the balloon, and you see the many stones uh, with filling defects in the gallbladder, and then we proceeded to do cholecystoscopy and remove the stones. Uh, but it was a premiere for Asia, um, and it was a very gratifying experience for me uh, at the time uh, because uh, of all the restrictions we face in the US. Fortunately, we're, we, we can do this now, although it is an off-label use the electrocautery enhanced system is currently only approved for the treatment of uh, pancreatic fluid collections. Next slide. So this is the multi-center trial that was done in Europe. And um, all of these uh, 30 patients with acute cholecystitis uh, in multiple uh, uh, leading centers in Europe uh, used the HOT system. Uh, their technical and functional success rate was uh, outstanding. Of course, these are all some of the best endosonographers in Europe, uh, all good friends of mine and all outstanding. In fact, there's uh, also Japan included there, I apologize, and Hong Kong, Anthony Teal is from Hong Kong. So Europe and Asia. Um, median total scope time, 15 minutes, which is remarkable, I think. And there were no serious adverse events early on. There, notably, no leak or peritoneum. Now, late, there were technically serious adverse events. I'm going to show you the list in just a moment. In half of the patients, um, but only 13% of these were possibly related to the stent or the procedure. Bear in mind that the criteria for inclusion in this study was that the patient was not a candidate for surgery. So these were sick patients with multiple comorbidities. And as you know, any event that occurs has to count, you know, be considered as a, as a serious adverse event. And then you determine what the relationship might be to the procedure or the device. Next slide. And here you see a list of the, an overview of all the serious adverse events and the review decision uh, of the committee. And you'll note that really the, the two stent related events were actually bleeding related. In patients, that had coagulopathies or other, other predisposing factors for bleeding. So there was nothing related to leak itself. And our goal was to eliminate leak. So we can't, of course, eliminate all the other things that can happen in sick patients. Next slide. So this is my last slide. So we again ask the question, is it ready for prime time? And I think the answer is yes. But we do have to meet three criteria or prerequisites. And the first is, this needs to be standardized. It needs to be controlled. Uh, it needs to be, I'd say, 100% reproducible. Right? This can't be left to operator technique that varies from one operator to another. I, I think this, this, this has to be, because there's so much at stake here. So this doesn't leave room for, you know, I'll show you the way I do it. We really need to do this all the same way. Um, next, it needs to be leak proof. And obviously, we need to follow the outcomes of these patients.
But so far, the data is supporting that we have created a leak-proof platform. And finally, and this is the open question, the only reason why we may not yet be ready for prime time, and that is that it should be durable. Now, I think you can make a strong argument for using this you know, in patients who are non-surgical candidates, where you're going to get into some debate until we have the durability data is whether we can offer this as an alternative to surgery. So the patient actually could tolerate surgery, but might we offer this as an alternative? That remains to be seen. Um, but I think we're getting very close uh, to prime time. 